the Knoxie and Cax Show with Liz Knox and Kara L. M. Ard. <laughs> Let's get it. Go. Welcome back to the Knoxie and Cax Show brought to you in partnership by the PWHPA and SDPN. Today's episode, honestly, a dream come true for me and Cax. Yep. Uh, beyond the many accolades, she will be remembered as the individual who inspired countless generations of, of young girls to pick up the hockey stick. She continues to inspire young women in the sports industry, and I cannot wait for you to get to know her on a whole new level. Cassie Campbell Pascal. Cass, thanks so much. Welcome, welcome. That introduction scares me. You're going to get to know me on a whole new level, but here we go. <laughs> That's what we're all about here. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously the legend, like Cax and I were talking about the 2002 Salt Lake city poster. And I feel like our era of player, like that was the image that was ingrained in our heads when we came home and, you know, we were five, six at the time, some of us younger, some of us older. And it's just that image that kind of inspired all of us that you could be an Olympic gold medalist on the women's hockey team. So it was a 20 year anniversary yesterday. Like what kind of emotions are you going through looking back at that team? Well, honestly, the, we text each other and the first emotion is we say, oh my God, how old we're getting. That's the first <laughs> thing we all talk about. But, um, you know, just, just how good of ambassadors everyone on that team was, you know, we, I think we all understood what, what our job was, you know, playing on that team. And, you know, even it, it kind of saddens me that the 98 team doesn't get more credit. And I, I think, you know, obviously the reason being that, we lost, but, you know, that group of people with France St. Louis and Stacey Wilson and, uh, you know, so many others that played Judy did it, uh, you know, to not bring that one home, I think really hurt a lot of us and, and helped us grow, um, you know, for that next four year cycle. So that the 10 or 12 of us who went on to 2002, we, we knew there was no way we could lose. Like we're, we're not going through this again. We owe it to this older group of players to bring home a gold medal. And it was a special group. You know, we, we had a lot of full, people working full time. And, um, you know, we were really just dedicated to the sport, much like you guys are, unfortunately, still we're we're professional athletes, but we're not being paid like professionals. And, um, but it really was a special group. And it's fun. Uh, our Mel Davidson, one of our coaches, she was our head coach in 2006 and assistant coach in 2002. She sent out an email yesterday. And it's kind of nice just to catch up with everybody. And um, you recognize your impact now because the players that are currently playing talk about it but you know at the time you, you just want to win right you just want to come home with a gold medal especially after losing the first olympics so um it was a special group for sure well talking about the impact that you guys had in the poster and stuff i was just reminiscing with liz right before this but um i don't know if you remember if you've ever seen it the so little binders uh, that they used yeah. to make the 98 and the 2002. I had both editions and I couldn't wait to just kind of like skim through. Cause obviously let's talk about this. All the men's teams were first. And then there was women's hockey at the end there, not a complete roster, uh, but the top players were there. And I remember uh, reading about, you know, you cat, uh, Wickenizer, uh, Geraldine, uh, trying to get to know these players that, you know, I, I barely saw for a quick minute or two or, full game uh, during that time but um, I, to be honest I don't think you've only hit our generation I think there's like even my parents and whomever will like see this is this is what you uh, you can do later on and stuff and and visibility right there I remember this little binder and Mark me probably and I wanted to play hockey but um, we're still fighting for this and stuff and and I, I was curious to see like you know you you said it a little bit there we're still fighting for the a similar thing that you kind of, mm -hmm. you guys were going through back there 20 years ago. Um, how does that, I don't know. What's your take on this? Yeah. I, well, I mean, you guys are way better than who we were. Who's kidding who? Uh, the no. skill level is, is no, the skill level is off the charts, which is amazing. And you, you know, you guys started training at a younger age than we did. And the professional side of it, I think started at a younger age um, because you did have a chance to see things, but um I don't think we're better off when I played like, yeah. I, you know, I played in the original Cowell league and um, you know, I played in the original NWHL. I, I was too old to play in the CWHL. It hadn't started yet, but you know, and I've watched these leagues grow and fold and grow and fold. And I often wonder if we're in a better spot and, and I'm, I'm not sure we are, you know, we can, 
we can make announcements that we're investing in women's hockey, but where's this money coming from? And and why are we still fundraising for, you know, let's, let's do like sell almonds. You know, I feel like, um, <laughs> you know, I feel like we're joke, still, but it's true. It's true. Yeah, I still feel like we're in the same place. And to be quite honest, I, I wonder if that original NWHL wasn't the best league to this day that we've ever seen, you know, just as far as trying to be professional, you know, having a Stanley cup trophy and, you know, all those types of things. And, um, you know, Susan Fennell was a big part of that. Colin McKenzie, the late Colin McKenzie was a big part of that. But I, I, I honestly feel that you, you guys are much more skilled. There's more players, there's more depth than we had, but I, I'm, I'm curious to really think that the league's any better than what I had. And, and I stopped playing 16 years ago. So, um, you know, it, it frustrates me. It makes me mad. It makes me fired up. It makes me want to work hard behind the scenes and, um, yeah, just continue to push. Did you hear yeah. that? Works hard behind yeah. the scene. Yeah, we will come back to that. <laughs> oh yeah, we, we have a we have a brief timeline for those listeners who maybe you know don't know your experience and and our experience as players through the many iterations of women's mm-hmm. hockey. So we will go back to it. But I believe you know our point was until you've been a young girl who finally saw a women's hockey team on TV. Yeah you can't understand how much that visibility matters to us because it, it really does set a goal. And uh, when we had Ailish Forfar on, you know, it doesn't matter if you played on the national team, it, it put fuel on a fire. That was your dream to play hockey one day. And so that, that 98 and that 2002 team uh, you know, that did it for us. So switching gears a little bit, speaking of, you know, <laughs> creating visibility and creating a dream for, you know, uh, the players coming up uh, behind you, we saw Megan Mickelson and Sh- Shannon Zabados uh, do some kind of game commentary recap in between periods. And, all, and yeah. you continue to inspire this next generation of players to seek out careers in, in the sports world. So I want to get your professional opinion on how our girls did, you know, <laughs> on the other side of the mic. Yeah. You know, exceeded all expectations. That was their first time. They have no idea what they're getting into. I think, People don't understand, obviously, being an athlete at the Olympics is a grind, but when you're commentating the Olympics, you have no idea how many games you're going to end up. You show up, you know, if you're there, you show up and they're like, you're doing all three games today. Oh, okay. Uh, (laughs) Then you got four tomorrow. Okay. And it, oh, no, we're going to just make you do one. And, you know, there's no set schedule because you just never know if if an event is going to be snowed out or, you know, they're going to need footage and coverage and, you know, they have it on three channels and, and it's a complete grind, you know, and, and the time change for them. I, I just thought they were remarkable. And, you know, having Megan Mickelson come back, you know, literally yeah. soon right after she was cut and just how professional she was at that and the stories that, you know, she she knew she couldn't tell, but she could tell. And, <laughs> you know, she did a good job of balancing that. And, you know, I talked to Zabby when she first got asked. She's like, Cass, like, what do I do? I'm like, OK, well, <laughs> what have they said to you? And, you know, I was kind of helping her go through her negotiations and, um, and then, you know, I know Megan Mickelson is going to do some PWHPA coming up and she's like, Cass, well, what do I do? I'm like, okay, here's some sheets. These are the sheets you can fill out. And these are the kind of things you need to know. So they, they were asking advice, which was awesome, but they're so smart, you know, and I think that's the thing about like most of us, all of us in the game, I guess I can include myself, but we're educated and we're smart and we're well-spoken and we're great ambassadors. And so I wasn't surprised that they did such a great job at the coverage and, and Cheryl Pounder as well. And Haley Salvian, who's been a great supporter of women's hockey and Kate Burness. And, you know, it was just a really good team. And and I think one thing people don't understand is the grind of covering the Olympics. You know, it's not just show up for the game. It's the research ahead of time. It's mm-hmm. finding out the day before that you might be doing Chechia, Russia, and you better be prepared. And, and then, you, you know, you've got these little hits and different things that you got to do to help promote it. So people watch it. So I was impressed with the job they did, but I wasn't surprised either. Right. I mean, they, they, they know people in the game. They've, they're connected in the game. They know the game. Uh, they've trained hard. They've trained like professionals and it came across on the air. Yeah. I, love I that. completely agree because the, the points and in, in you spoke about it. I love that Mickelson was bringing a little bit of like the inside the locker room aspect without giving mm-hmm. too much. And I, I think, I hope actually, you know, viewers and, and everyone that we're watching just enjoyed that too. It's a different, it's a different angle. Um, and it's something that like no one else could have done basically other than her. And again, her professionalism was off the chart, basically coming in. I think she accepted this probably two days after or something. So yeah. Yeah. It, and we, awesome. we spoke I about it. Yeah. We yeah. spoke about Mickelson also in a, you know, in a, a pre-recorded episode uh, that I don't think it aired, but 
the journey that she went through, yeah. uh, you know, basically blowing out her knee uh, just under a year ago now, making a full recovery, like basically a miracle. If you ask any of her physiotherapists or doctors, like this is an, a, an injury that's very hard to come back from uh, definitely in 12 months. And she did it in, you know, less than eight. And then to finally, you know, achieving that goal of, of being able to try out for this Olympic team, put in a good effort to fall short, you know, in, in some people's eyes, not make that final roster and then say yes to the next opportunity, which is to go to the games and cover it. I mean, just an incredible person, uh, you know, great head on our shoulders and obviously extremely resilient. So um, speaking of resiliency, this leads us, you know, perfectly. This is, good segue. Good segue. Perfect. This is a perfect segue. Set up. Okay. So let's talk about boot camp. Yes. Now, Cax is going to talk about this because she knows a little bit more of the history. Not really, but I just I just <laughs> heard here and there um, the reasons why the boot camp was kind of like created, and and we spoke about it, uh, Liz and I. And and what I want to to get out of of this conversation here is is obviously your take and some fabulous stories that you'll tell us. Uh, but for our listeners, boot camp was kind of like. Uh, introduced to you guys and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but after it in the early, what, before 98 or 2002? I think 2002 was our first one. Right. Mm -hmm. So you, again, boot camp, beginning of centralization, kind of like setting you guys up to pretty much feel like you're about to die and then go on <laughs> and have a greatest journey yeah. of your life <laughs> together. <Yeah. laughs> so talk to us a little bit about boot camp and, and kind of like, obviously it, it wasn't that bad, but it was nearly or close. No, to it was bad. Right? It was bad. <laughs> it was, uh, basically, I think it was three weeks that we usually did in May. Uh, so we would normally centralize in August, September, and we would right. get together for three weeks in May somewhere. And our first one was in Valcartier, Quebec. It was uh, on an army base there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got to train with all our Canadian, you know, women and male soldiers. And it was just an amazing experience. But it it was, I mean, you train seven times a day. We would fill out our nutrition log and we would what? send it back to our nutritionist. And she would say, oh, my gosh, they're eating so much. And then she'd find out what we were doing. And <laughs> we literally trained seven times a day and we'd wake up and train and then go grab something to eat quick and train and then go back and do train. And like, it was just, I, honestly, I, I look back and I think I put my body through mentally and physically all it could go through. Right. And, um, but I think we were all better for it. And the, the essence of it was that if we could get through three weeks of training camp, boot camp, if you will, mm -hmm. that we could get through anything that the Olympics was going to th throw at us in three weeks. And, but at the same time, it put us all to a, a level of extreme mental and physical fatigue. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when you learn to become a team is when you're challenged to the extreme. Right. And you figure out, okay, who's with me and who, who do I need to help pull along and who do I need to help drag me? And you really, I think we really got to know each other on a level that we hadn't known each other before. And I think that was really important. And, you know, the, the crazy thing about the national women's team is everyone thinks, oh, they're all best friends. Well, no, that's not the case, but I think we, <laughs> we all grew to respect each other and our differences and what makes us tick. And, um, you know, how do we push this person to be the best they can be? How do they push me to be the best they could be? And we learned that through boot camp. And at the same time, we had a lot of fun because we were so <laughs> bored, you know, we're stuck in this place, you know, and Frenchland too. Frenchland. Yeah. In and Quebec. we couldn't do anything. We couldn't go anywhere. I mean, you said that. I didn't say that. Yeah, but, I did. Um, I did. That's okay. Uh, I'm you know, and then we did one in PEI, which is where my family's from. And so that was pretty special for me. But again, it was, you know, I was rooming with Tessa Bonham and Kim St. Pierre, and we have to be on the beach. It sounds glamorous on the beach at 7 30. And like, we're just dry. Like, our group was late almost every day. And of course, I was the captain of the team. So the coach would just look at me, like, with these glared eyes, like, honestly, you're late again. I'm like, yeah, okay, we are. Um, but the three of us had so much fun and we really didn't know each other. Like, as much as I played with Kim in 2002, you know, we're apart so much that, like, that camp, I really got to know her and I really got to know Tess and she was uh, new. And uh, so it, 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 there's so many reasons why they're so beneficial for our group, but they were hard. And, yeah. and I think the group now, the level of fitness just continues to get better and better and better that the boot camp's a little bit different, but, and we weren't able to have one this time around just because of COVID, but we had a good plan. Let me tell you, we had a really good plan. And, um, I think for this group in particular, it would have been more about team building 
leadership, that kind of thing, more so than training. We, oh, yeah. we were going to put them through some good training, but uh, it would have been more about off ice kind of stuff that we would have felt was important. I love it. I love it. And then um, just one little question is, is what kind of like, let's say boot camp, what kind of you're saying seven, seven workouts, like I'm going to the gym, this is a workout for me or whatever. I run yeah. to the track and that's it. Like what kind of stuff were you actually kind of pushing or had in to do just one example of like, yeah so I, I'll, i'll take you through a day in pei we'd okay. get up and we were we would do skill sessions on the ice so we'd be broken up into two or, or sometimes it was just one large group and we had stations and everything was about our heart rates and monitoring that and uh, I, like i i never really understood half that stuff but um it was just it was just painful the ice session was painful in itself and we just go around the stations and it was you know anaerobic like and uh yeah and then we come off and we do a weight session and then we do a yoga and then we Stretch. you know have to run around some kind of track and then you know maybe we do another weight session that day and then we'd have to you know speak to our sports psychologists and have a session there and like it just went from the morning to night you know there was yeah. always kind of something and um we we would love the cafeteria in valcarche quebec for example because All the soldiers would be there too, right? So we'd be like, oh, look at them and look how cool they are. And we'd want to talk to them. And by the end of the week, we'd have a few people, you know, that we'd know. And, and so that was kind of fun. But it was just all day training and and you never really recovered. Like that was the yeah, thing. Yeah, that's what I was camps. just going to say. Yeah, you never, you honestly, physically, mentally, you were put through the ringer. And um, yeah, so it was fun. Yeah. I got to ask now because I can only imagine myself in this scenario. Like, I feel like there's like two types of people. You're either, you know, we used to say pull in the wagon or ride in the wagon. Like you're either the, the, the cax who's like, okay, we're going to get energy up, get everyone going, let's go. Or she's you're just like, going to run through people. That's yeah. what she's going to do. Yeah. Or you're like, I'm going to sit on this wagon and cry until I get to go home. So in your, you know, your little threesome, you, you mentioned uh, St. Pierre and Testament Om. What role kind of did the three of you play? Were they similar <laughs> roles? Did you guys clash? Like, I'm, I'm curious yeah. to know how this really broke That's down. That's a good one. We didn't, yeah. we never clashed. Tess and I are a lot, were a lot alike. She's sort of a younger version of me. And, um, and Kim, it, it, there was some kind of controversy going on. I don't know why this says my hand is raised. I, I didn't do it, I swear. But it, there was some kind of controversy going on. And I don't mean to make light of this, but uh, there was a famous singer in Quebec that uh, I think she was, there was a, an abuse situation or something. And it was the big news in Quebec. And so she, you know, wanted to watch it. And I couldn't speak French and Tess could. So we'd watch this show every night to keep Kim And we'd watch it in French and I'd be sitting there and, and they'd be like, Oh my gosh. And they, and I'd be like, what, what, what's happening? You know? And we, we kind of bonded over Kim's show. We all cooked. We all chipped in with the cooking. Um, we ended up having a bit of a, a bug and a mice problem in our cabin. So that bonded us. Um, Tess and I had to take care of Kim. I was the one that was like, okay, I got to find how they're coming in and set the traps accordingly. And Tess was sort of my assistant and, Kim was the one that kind of stood on her bed or the couch, you know, <laughs> we just, but we all chipped in with meals. We all chipped in with cleaning. Like when, it, when it got to the point where, Hey, we can't be late one more time. You know, we just buckled down and uh, it, I, you really bonded in that, that camp, just you're living with these people for three weeks. And um, yeah. And, and Kim and I, I think just became, even though we'd won a gold medal in 2002 together, we just became good friend, friends through that camp. And, You know, her and I are of the same generation. She's a little bit younger of me, but we kind of grew up in the program together, you know, sort of. And, and Tess is, Tess is a mini me and I, or I'm an older version of her. I don't know how it works, but we, we get along really well and we still do. And we still connect to each other all the time and um, help each other through different things. So uh, I, I think each house bonded in that way. And I think the coaching staff put a group together knowing that you didn't know each other very well. Mm -hmm, and, right. um, and I thought that, made it even more special, right? Where you get an opportunity to truly get to know your teammates for who they are. For sure. Yeah. For such sure. a unique, unique experience. And, and kind of, as you alluded to uh, earlier in the episode, you know, you've seen women's hockey now evolve, devolve, re-evolve uh, over the last 20 plus years. Um, so I, I wanted to, I do want to give our listeners a, a brief understanding of kind of what we're talking about here. So the, the original NWHL, we're going to start in 2000. The original NWHL uh, was formed in 1999. 
It closed in 2007. There was three divisions of the league uh, in Ontario, Quebec, and then a Western Conference. And it, in their last season, because it they had teams come in and come out, there was 13 teams in its final season. So this is uh, the league that you, uh, you know, Jaina, um, Angel James, this is the league that you guys all played in. Um, in 2007, when the NWHL closed its doors, the CWHL was formed. And that ran from 2007 to 2019. And this was like kind of a player's uh, response. It was, from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, was like you basically had a summer. You guys were somewhat blindsided by the NWHL shutting down. The players bond together, say, we need somewhere to play because we're going to keep playing. And you formed the CWHL as a not-for-profit league. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I mean... Uh- I, I remember hearing rumblings. We had an own, we had some ownership groups for the original NWHL, and I remember hearing rumblings that they were leaving. You know that they were going to be done. And rather than find out in September, hey, where do you want to have a league? Um, I held a meeting in, in May. I think it was May of that year, uh, and my dates might be incorrect, but um, Susan Fennel was there. The OWHA uh, was there. Vicky Senahara was there. There was a Sammy Joe Small, I believe, was there. Uh, and we just asked the owners, like, what's going on? And thank God we had that meeting because they were leaving, you know, and, Seriously. and there's a lot of different things that came in. I'm giving you guys the Coles notes, but so we found out at that point, we didn't have a league. And uh, then there was a group of people that sort of stepped up to help start the Canadian women's hockey league. And, um, and for me personally, I, 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 we needed to hire someone like we couldn't do this anymore, just based on volunteers. And right. so that's when we hired Brenda and dress and, uh, and Sammy Joe was a big part of that. And there was another group of people, Kathleen Cobb and Hef and there's Ali Fox. There's a long list. And, and I apologize for those I might be forgetting. But um, and then once we hired Brenda, my thought process was, Brenda, we need a board. Like you can't be making all the decisions. You need to protect mm-hmm. yourself. And so we started a board and um, there were so many key people. But Brad Morris came in, who's uh, in charge of our Ladies First Foundation. And, and he, is, he had daughters that played and he became our chair. And I really thought took it to another level. And, you know, we brought in a lot of people that had sponsorship con- contacts and, but, and it was a great, it was successful, but under the not for profit model yeah. that it started at, there's no way that could be sustained into a professional league. Right. And so unfortunately, you know, I, I, I personally left the board for a variety of reasons about two, three years before it folded. Um, some of it was personal. Some of it was, uh, getting stuff off my plate some of it there's my hand again can you guys see my hand i don't just know yeah. constant yeah, high five. <laughs> um i don't know how that happens like i'm over here and my computer's yeah. over there but um so yeah just so many people were involved but one thing that's constant about women's hockey is i think of two groups who are like this and i think genuinely they want what's best for the women's game but i also think there's some that want what's better for them in within the women's game and so um we always sort of had the OW versus the NWHL or Susan Fennell versus the OW. And um, I don't know. And then, then it was the CWHL versus the new NWHL. And right. now it's the PWHL. It, it, like, it's just, um, it's, it's mind boggling that we can't figure out that to me, in my opinion, I've always said one league and some people criticize me for that because they're like, Oh no, we need more leagues. And well, of course we do, but we need one la- league that's, sustainable and has a proper infrastructure and that can survive the long term with deeper pockets. And then we can have a whole body of elites that surround it that will work, you know? And yes. um, So that's sort of how it all happened. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in that CWHL board and and to watch it fold and um, you know, it was, it was devastating. There's no question, you know, everyone who was involved, I think in that original group found it really devastating. And of course you, the players and, and, um, but it wasn't going to be sustainable, the not for profit. And I, I think, you know, if, if it wasn't for COVID, I truly believe we'd have a, a true professional women's hockey league at this point, but um, we're really, really close. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and you kind of alluded to it there. We touched on it a little bit. So the CWHL, uh, we had six teams in our final season in 2019, of course, the two teams in China um, in 2015. So just over midway through the kind of, you know, lifespan of the CWHL, the NWHL, now known as the PHF, was formed. And, you know, from CACs and my standpoint, this was a league that promised a lot, 
came kind of seemingly out of nowhere, um, you know, over the, over a summer saying, this is the next pro league. We're going to pay all of our players. This is what you guys have been waiting for. Um, by geography, you know, alone pulled a lot of the national team and, and draw, of course, because and they, they were, were part of it. Let's, let's put it that way. The players right. on the U S side were actually part of that creation of that league. And seemed like they were heard and everything. So there is some positive. Yeah. There. And they had some say in it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, so they kind of jump ship from the CW, go play NWHL. Um, you know, unfortunately had a poor experience in their first one or two years, um, yeah. you know, didn't receive the salaries that they were promised. It's, it's the story that, you know, you hear is that there was a lot of over promise and under delivered. Um, so then those players, core group of players, you know, slowly back. trickle back to the CWHL in our final season in 2019, you know, we have most of the Canadian, well, all of the Canadian, I would say, Olympic team that aren't, you know, NCAA or U sport athletes and uh, a, a vast majority of the U.S. team. Um, so now there's, as Cass said, there's the CWHL and the NWHL. And then when the CW folds, we formed the PWHPA. Um, you know, we had a phone call with the NW. And they want, you know, the, to them, this was an easy fix. All of our players will just go play NW. We'll wash our hands of this drama between women's hockey. And, you know, we move forward. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of our players, it was still a fresh wound for them that, you know, yeah. they were promised so much and and didn't receive, you know, kind of on the word of the, of the organization. So now here we are again, all this to say. Yes, we are the PWHPA. Yes, the PHF is still, you know, operating, um, you know, paying its players, not a livable wage, but paying its players. Um, they play on weekends. They practice late on weeknights. This is, the, you know, for players like Cax and I, this is a new face of exactly what the CWHL was, which is a great yeah. place to play with your friends um, and make a little bit of money. But it's certainly not that viable, you know, future that we're hoping for. It's not the, the the true professional league that we want to create or leave for the next generations, that's for sure, or that true opportunity like the men's side is getting. And you alluded to it a little bit, just the treatments and those players that came back to the CWHL and, and were really, we can't do this again. We can't have another N-dub or another C-dub, so let's let's do something different, and that's that's how the PW uh, kind of started and, and being an association, not a league, an association that is in place to advise and also c- try to create something or be sitting at this one table that will, you know, be part of like making this league down the road and however it is. So it's, it's completely different. I hate when people are like, Oh yeah, there's two leagues. It's, it's not two leagues people. It's an association and a league and a new league will be created and we'll see how it goes, but it's, it's for the best of this game and, and the actual true sustainable opportunity we want to create that Cassie was just talking about there. 20 years ago or yeah. 1999. Here we are still you know, it's, swinging. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. And without so, them and without cast, we wouldn't be here. Exactly. And, and we do, we owe it to the people that created, you know, the original NW, the CW, the NW now PHF, like these are all opportunities for us. And, you mm-hmm. know, you, I think Mel DeRoche said, you never want to shit on the people that are working hard for you. Um, so we definitely appreciate that. So my question then, Cassie, you know, you kind of spearheaded this Scotiabank Girls Hockey Fest. You are behind the scenes in a lot of these conversations. Um, I just want to know, like, what keeps you, what has kept you going for 20 years fighting for the future and the professionalization of women's hockey? Because like, let's be honest, a lot of people would have thrown in the towel by now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've thrown a few towels. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think just like the game has given me a lot. So it's just like giving back. And, you know, I, I was one of the fortunate athletes, you know, through my Olympic career that I, I had a ton of sponsors, you know, and um, I got to a point like when I first got sponsors, I was like, oh, this is really cool. And, ooh, I, I, I can make a living and I get a free shirt. And I get to travel around and do like Chevrolet safe and fun programs. And, um, and then I, you know, about two, three years after feeling like that, I was kind of like, okay, I'm in a position where I can get these sponsors to help the women's game. And that's my, so anytime I sign a deal, uh, I'm like, okay, great. That's, I really love it. Um, thank you. This works for me, but what are you going to do for women's hockey? And Scotiabank was one of the, I, I, I worked for many different companies and still do, but Scotiabank was by far above and beyond anything that I could have ever imagined. And, you know, they sponsored the CWHL right away, no press conference, no fanfare, no, just, yep, here we go. 
you know, we did with the Scotiabank Girls Hockey Fest. I think this is going to be the 16th year. Now COVID hit us. So, you know, there was a few years there where we couldn't do it. But then we did the Scotiabank Rising Teammates, which incorporated a bunch of the PWHBA players. And, um, and like, we have put people like Caitlin Keon, for example, she works for Scotiabank. And I taught her at the Scotiabank Girls Hockey mm-hmm. Fest when she was like seven, eight years old. And now she's so running cool. Scotiabank Girls Hockey Fest. And, um <laughs> We just have people, Lisa Ferkel and, and Kelsey Wolf and so many people that just know the importance of what we're trying to do. And at the same time, they've met with other entities and like, how are we doing the right thing? Like they've done their research and their homework. And, um, but I, I, I don't know, like the game has given me so much. I love it. I have fun. Sometimes I feel like I, I went to the men's side when I first got into broadcasting and I, I had this guilty feeling like, am I still doing enough for the game? And, um, you get asked to do a lot. And I've learned now that like, for example, this whole PWHPA thing, I've really had to step back from it. Like, you know, Hef calls me and keeps me in the loop and asks for advice and bounces things off me and stuff like that. But I, I really had to uh, let you guys run it. Like, I don't want to say run it, but spread your little ways. And, <laughs> and part of it is the personal thing. Like I needed to pull back, but part of it is that that's part of leadership, right? Is uh, stepping away when time comes and letting other people do it. And you guys have done a tremendous job and, and people who talk about the U S Canada rivalry, they see what they see on the ice, but yeah. that group to come together off the ice and do what they're doing now, it's, it's pretty incredible. And for you guys to really put your careers on hold, I never had to do that. I, I never, I always had somewhere to play. Um, that to me is just incredible. That's the ultimate sacrifice. So uh, I honestly, I take no credit for any of this. And you, you just, you know, if you're in a position where you, you, you have sponsors and you have different things and you have a voice and you have a platform for me, it's never been like, Oh, let me put out a tweet. That'll solve everything. Oh, this <laughs> is going to be great. Boy, I'm going to use my platform. You know, no, my platform is when the under 18 world championships is canceled. I call the president of the IHF, you know, like <laughs> that's what I do. And, and I say, <laughs> like, do you believe in women's hockey? And I got a great answer and I still keep in contact with them. And that's what your platform is. It's not about tweeting and doing this. It's about, you know, someone like Jane is stepping up to run the PWHPA. Yeah. And you guys doing what you do using your platform as players. And um, so that's my motivation is I, I get to watch you guys now do it. And it, it kind of makes me pretty proud, you know, so it's awesome. <laughs> this is the best answer ever. Uh, I, I know. <laughs> I, I feel sorry. Like- and my hand is still raised. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Like, I don't understand what's going on here. And, and like you know what? To ask, I want to ask myself a question. <laughs> yeah, you know? Exactly. Oh, and you God. know what? I think I think that represents you uh, like amazingly in a sense of like, yeah, I like this sponsor, and yes, I'll do business with you. But what else can you offer to the group? And I think that's also what happened between Canada and US when they met at Worlds. Um, and decided to just be like, okay, this is not okay. We need to, you know, take this in our hands and, and move forward with it. And since day one, um, and, and this is maybe news for listeners or whatever, but they've always made it so that the non-national players were the most important thing for this league. So like it, it is, um, it is truly felt from, me as a player, but also like the groups around us to feel like, okay, it's not just about them and them having a league. They truly know that they need the pool of players and they want to actually leave this game way better than it's ever been. And, and this yeah. is the first time that I get to see it from my own eyes. And I feel like your guys is your, your group there, Cass, like building those leagues and the C-dub and starting that was kind of the, the same thing that you guys were doing it was for more than than just yourselves basically. I, I think you guys underestimate and I, I know both of you have been in the national program at some point in your careers and um but I think you guys underestimate the importance of the club player to the national team players because without you first of all you're our teammates every day all year long mm-hmm. and without you we don't get as good as we can get to to go to the olympic games and you know, I think of so many of my teammates, Carol Cooper, Summer West, Amy Turek, um, uh, like the list goes on and on of how great one of my best friends in the game, Sarah Oppelgarth, I went to university with her and, uh, and the work and the dedication that she had, you know, you deserve to play at the Olympics just as much as any of us. And so I, I think that's one thing that if you ever doubt that, like 
it's crazy because I think all the national team players truly understand the importance of the club player because those are the ones that I think are sacrificing the most. You know, they're the ones that, that got to get up and go to work. You know, we get to go up and go to the gym and that's our job and, and go shoot pucks and stick handle. And you guys are like trying to do that plus work. And so we value the the club level player because it's, it's more than that uh, so much. And I'm glad you guys understand that. And it's funny too, because, um, you know, you talk about the, the working uh, non-national team member, um, but you mentioned Caitlin Keon's name before. And the further into this, you know, that I've gotten, the more I've realized that the connections we make yeah. seemingly outside of hockey are actually, you know, women's hockey players who have become, you know, marketing agents, uh, you know, lawyers, um, you know, there's a, such a broad spectrum of former women's hockey players played at, you know, an elite level, played at college, came back, got into the workforce, and now they're finding their way to give back to the game. And, and just in you saying Caitlin Keon, uh, I know that she played with Kristen Richards. And I just think every time I meet one of these people, I think, you know, you could have very easily been in my shoes right now. You could have very easily continued to play, uh, but you made the decision to, you know, put your career first. And now you're, you know, we see this network just slowly growing this like web of, of players that now see this opportunity to give back to the game. And, you know, much like yourself, Cass, if given the opportunity, um, these women are really stepping up. So I love to have those connections, you know, when I'm around the rink or at, at different events um, and, and know that these are actually, you know, they're one of our, they're one of us, you know, they're, they're former yeah. hockey players. Well, and that's the thing. Like I remember back in the day, I I'd meet with these corporate groups and there was no woman. <laughs> There was yeah. no one who even knew anything about yeah. women's hockey. And now I go and Caitlin's like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And this is why. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> this is good. And, you know, Burks is, is the same Lisa Furkle who runs the marketing department. And like, that is refreshing. Cause back in the day it was like, you know, and, and Chevrolet was a great company to work for, but you know, we, I used to show up and it was like two girls in a camp and I'm like, Oh, this, this is not sitting well. <laughs> um, and eventually I just, I worked it up. I was like, I want to have an all girls camp. Like, let's make it happen. And, you know, back in the day, we d didn't necessarily have enough depending on which center you were at, but it was a priority for me to push. So if we were in a small center, listen, I, I need at least, at least 10 girls out of the 30 kids, like, come on, we can do this, you know, even if it's first timers. And, and so it was just kind of pushing those things. Cause it's not like they didn't care about women's hockey. Cause obviously they did having me there. It's just, they didn't know how to help it. Yeah, right? right. And so you just, you, you know, now it's just my job so much easier. I just show up to a meeting and I have a few ideas, but they've already been discussed 25 times and <laughs> they already know, you know, where they're going to go. And um, so it, it kind of makes my job easier in that sense. But yeah, it's Scotiabank is great. And I know we're sitting here talking about them because they're a sponsor of the PWHPA and I work for them. But honestly, like of all the companies that I've ever worked for, they've done the most for women's hockey by far. And we love them. Just yeah. love to see them good. support the gals. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So we've talked a long history of women's hockey. Um, love your perspective. Thank you so much for sharing that. We're going to get to some fun questions because, oh, <laughs> you know, we knew having you on the show that there's maybe some stories behind some things. So, um, this is where I'm nervous. Text, I'm yeah, kind of nervous. I'll, I'll ask be. the first one. I'll ask yeah. the first one. And then okay. it's not that bad. Yes. Come on. So, um, we spoke with a, bunch of different people and whatnot. And, and we found out some cool information, but why is Columbus your favorite city that you've ever played in? Uh, <laughs> oh gosh. So, <laughs> you know, back in my day, we weren't really allowed to go out after, you know, I don't, we were kind of treated a little bit like minor hockey, despite the fact that we were grown women. And I'll, I'll never forget this. I, at the latter part of my career, I never napped. I, I don't know what it was, but I just was like, too tired to nap maybe I don't know yeah. <laughs> but um I remember we we're in Columbus and we we're, we're playing there and, and that's where Tess went to school Ohio State Tessa yeah. Benham and she was so excited to have a tour like tour us around Columbus she was just gonna show us the basketball court and the football field and no one would go so I'm like <laughs> Tess I'll go I'm in I'm game and so she took me to Chipotle like that was the big thing back then yeah. this Chipotle which is like Still you know is. everyone knows that <laughs> and we went to the football field and it was locked. So she was sad and we went to the basketball field and, or the court and, you know, she took me around the gym and the rink and, you know, she was so proud. Right. And I'm like, ah, I'll play the same if I nap or not. So um, we had a lot of fun that day. And then one of our last nights in Columbus, 
we're like, you know, what? we're going to, we're going to go for a beer. And it, it sounds like, yeah, I'll go for a beer. You're 32 years old, but that wasn't how it worked. And so a few of us kind of snuck out, if you will. And we went to this bar in Columbus called the main bar. Mm -hmm. And it was like this cute little hole in the wall bar. And, uh, you know, I think it was like a Thursday night thing. If you went to Ohio state and I'm, I'm totally telling a story that I don't really know much about, but we go there and we have fun and we end up getting back late and we're just praying. No one knows. And so anyway, years later I was doing an NHL game, uh, in Columbus and Gary Galley was working with Gary Galley. Who's a great friend of mine. And, and I said, Gary, we got to go to this place. It's called the main bar. Like you won't believe it. And when we were there, we, w- we went down into the basement and you literally could walk through this passage and then you could stick your head out the manhole, like in the middle of the street. <laughs> So I bring back my friend, Gary Gallagher, and I said, Gary, we got to get them to take us to the basement and I'll show you this thing and you can push the manhole up. And he's like, all right. Like he, he was like me entertaining Tessa on her tour. He was like, okay, guys, I'll, I'll just come with you. So sure enough, he gets the bartender. He's like, listen, I'm here with my friend. You, you need to allow this to happen. Like, this is like just one of these moments in her life and whatever. So sure enough, we go down in the basement and the guy's like, hey, there's no trap door here. There's no manhole. And I'm like, no, 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 like there is. And I take him to the back corner and sure enough, it's been cinder blocked. Like, but you can see the passage. And I said, see, we had to move boxes. And, and uh, I said, see, this is where you used to walk out and you could walk out under the street. And I remember I called Tessa that night. I said, you won't believe where I am. I'm at the main bar in Columbus. And you know, she was just laughing and, um, you know, just silly, silly, stupid. That's not even really a funny story, but it's, a, it's it. a typical hockey story, right? Where yeah. we're all bored out of our minds and we need something to do. And, um, and yeah, so we always have the main bar. Yeah. That's, it's a pretty cool spot. If you ever go to Columbus, I think it's still there. It's uh, it's a pretty good time. I mean, it's on the list now. Cause I feel like this is, uh, you know, Columbus we're going to put the main bar on the map in women's hockey here. This is going to be <laughs> a, a go-to a, yeah. venue. A great my, city now look, to. now some, I have a thumbs up. So some, <laughs> I feel like someone's in my computer doing this. That's a great story. Cass. Zoom <laughs> like that story. Yeah. Do you guys see it? Or is it just <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can okay. see it. Oh, oh it's that's so, great. This is creepy. Don't you feel like high fives and thumbs up? I'm like, it's <laughs> the ghost in my from house, the main like, bar. This is a bit um, weird. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> we, we also talked to Jaina, obviously you and Jaina go way back and, uh, she tipped us off to ask why you're such a legend at the Dupuy Hefford hockey uh, school. Well, we did that hockey school for years. And finally, like I, I, when I moved out West, it was just, it became a bit too much to travel all the way back to Kingston. So I, I ended up not doing the hockey school, but I think I was a legend because I, I got free meals for the campers on Fridays. McDonald's would show up with all these cheeseburgers and French fries for the little <laughs> campers. And uh, we, we just never slept. You know, we just, we would go to the hockey school, we would train and we'd go back to have house and we'd sleep or we she had a pool and we'd throw those rings in the pool and we'd have a barbecue and we'd have a few drinks. And, and we just, I swear to God, we just swam in that pool for like eight hours after the camp was over. We never sleep. It was just nuts. And then the last night they always took us on um, uh, a tour of the Thousand Islands, I believe it is. It's like yep. a boat cruise. <laughs> well, there was always like karaoke and it, like it just got out of control. And um, yeah, that honestly, I had to stop doing that hockey school because it took me like two weeks to recover, you know? <laughs> and so. Say. As I got older, I just, I couldn't afford two weeks of recovering. And, um, but we just had a lot of fun and, and that school, I don't even know. I think it's, it started in 99, 99, and I think it's still going and her and Lori, we do it and it's remarkable. And, you know, again, you go back to that 2002 group and how much they gave back to the game. And that was just a great example of it. Yeah. It's funny. Cause we had Jen LaCasse on a, a previous episode and when she was describing the camp, she's like, yeah, you know, like, it's really great. We work four hours so then we can train the rest of the day. And I was like, girl, I was not training. Like, I didn't know. That's why that was, I just thought it was like, oh, you're going to be, you know, hung over all day. So I'll only make you work for four hours. And then oh, I'll God. just go. Well, we had to again. work eight hours. So big change <laughs> over the years. They got we had to work up on us. But you know, it's funny. <laughs> we taught Megan Augusta came to that school she was nine years old and then she made the 2006 Olympic team. And I was like, I got to retire. Like I can't be playing with the same kids that I just taught in hockey school. So 
that was a really key moment for me when I'm like, oh my God, Gus. And like, I'm like, I, I've got to get out of here. You know, like, what am I still doing playing? So that you was probably get that all the time still though. Like, oh, I went to your camp and you know, I mean, I, I didn't ever go to the Dupuy Hefford hockey camp, but I went to Laura Schuler's and you know, she yeah. was, she was your generation player. So I you probably get that all the time running into people. <laughs> Who'd you go to? I went to France St. Louis and then oh. <laughs> oh and stuff like we all went to those. And then, you know, now Carol has her camps here and is doing the same. And yeah, I feel like it's a, like whomever let's say who as a coach is like teaching now is like some are upcoming now. And she's, she's now not you Cass, but she is now one of the oldest. Yeah. On that team, yeah. You know? and she's getting old. Yeah. No, she's no, she's old. young, crazy. young and healthy and still can go for <laughs> yeah. a long, long time. Do you know what's time. funny? My <laughs> brother, I went to PEI every summer and my brother got to go to the Allen Andrews hockey school. I never was allowed to go. And Alan, God love him. He's the best friend of my dad and like family to me, but it wasn't thought of, Oh, let's put Cassie in too. No, just Jeff. And then I'd, you know, hang out at the farm and stuff. But um, when I finished in 98, he called me, said, let's start a woman's school. And I was like, okay, but I have a question. <laughs> How come I was never allowed to go to your camp? And he's like, well, I think it was your father. And then my father would say, Oh, I think it was Alan, you know? Yeah. And but it was funny that, that like I played hockey and yet my parents never thought to put me in that hockey school. And um, so now we started a women's school. So like, for example, Jill Stallone went there and Blair Turnbull went there. Um, friends of mine uh, have, who you sport athlete, Sarah Foley, she was there. Um, and now it, my daughter went two summers ago, three summers ago. Now my daughter went with some friends. We all stayed in PEI and put our kids in. And, and like, that was a huge moment for me to like, this is a hockey school I was never allowed to go to. And now my daughter can just go and, you know, she it was a mixed group and uh, she had the time of her life, you know, and um, times just change. And I don't yeah. think generally people back in the day didn't want me to not play. Like, I just think that's the way it was. This and wasn't they a thing. didn't know any better and mm -hmm. it wasn't malicious. It wasn't, they just thought they were doing the right thing. And the right thing we know now is to let young girls play sports. Absolutely. And it, it's so funny too, because I, I was, you know, similar story. My grandfather ran a hockey school at a Sudbury, Ontario. Um, but of course, where Tess is from. And the only reason I got to play was because I was related to him and he, he ran the school. I was the only girl. Uh, you know, they said no to all the other girls, but I knew someone in high places so I could play. And same, I'm sure as you're, you know, everyone's experienced playing at those all boys uh, schools or all boys teams. You know, it's it's tough. You, you to get picked someone. on a lot. Yeah. Like yeah. it's and it's how not, old are you? How old do you not see? I was now? Now, yeah. So I'm thirty four. Yeah. So like so, I'm so a lot older and uh it still was happening at your age, right? Like it's yes. that's crazy. And I, I think it still happens today, but just mm -hmm. hopefully, well, I know not as much and uh that's nuts, yeah. It's yeah, you're just a young kid. Oh, it, go ahead, Cax. I was just going to say, quiet it down a little bit. Now they have new ways to do it. So it's yeah. it's just like, you know, it's uh, people now growing. And if we can just educate the new generations to be open-minded, then we're all set. Girls mm -hmm. belong. That's all. Raise your well, hand to that. Raise your hey! hand. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. That was a good it timing. Now it's like thumbs up. And then if, I'm oh. just leaving it. Whatever happens. Oh, yeah. my gosh. I it just doesn't. You know, which finger doesn't show up. This is not me, I swear. My hands are right here. I'm not touching this. All of a sudden, Cass is flipping us the bird. Like, all right, I'm, let's wrap oh, this up. Gosh. She's hated this. Um, I feel so, like there's a ghost in my house. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, I'm sporting my Tragic Hip t-shirt. Uh, mm -hmm. They're my favorite band. Um, I was told to ask what your favorite hip song and or memory was. Um, well, it, you know, it had nothing to do with really any of my hockey friends, uh, the hip bunch of my girlfriends I grew up with, we would go to Molson Park and Markham Fairgrounds every Canada day. And we, that was the hip, you know, we, and what would happen is you'd be driving your car and I always drove, um, you know, driving the car and all of a sudden you hit the 400 in Ontario and it's dead stop. And everyone's going to the hip concert, like everyone, that's why the traffic is there. So the, you, you'd have, your friends would be poking out your sunroof, sitting on your windows, the music would be blaring. And, we just had so many great times and it was, you know, I was sort of that age of 17, 18, you know, early university. And, um, I grew up with an amazing group of friends that some of them I played sports with and some of them I didn't, but we, there was about five or six of us that were so different in so many ways, but yet so the same. And, 
uh, we would go to this concert every year. You know, we'd all go to university and then come back and reunite on Canada Day. And um, Boots or Hearts was a big one for me. But any hip song. And, and I got to be close to Gore Downey, Blake Gore Downey, actually through Hef. Hef knew the hip from Kingston and she introduced us and him and I became friends. And, um, you know, a, 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 honest to God, the, one of the last concerts I saw was here in Calgary. And uh, I texted him that day and I said, do you mind just playing Boots or Hearts? Like, you know, they've already got their set, you know, they like, but he played it. And I like, Aww. it was just, uh, it was so cool. Yeah. He, he was a great guy and they're a great band. And, and it, I got to know them through Hef and it, uh, yeah, it was awesome. But I love Boots or Hearts is my favorite song. And it's not really a great song if you think about lyrics, but <laughs> it's a great song just for having great times around it. That, that was the key for me. Yeah, I think yeah. that's that summarizes it perfectly, right? There's something about the hip. You just picture summertime and barbecue season and being with a good group of friends. And uh, I, I'm with you, you know, lots of hockey girls in and out of that circle. So uh, thanks for sharing that memory with us. And honestly, just thanks for being on the show. Thanks for being open to this. Uh, you know, I hope it's not the last time because I know that there's uh, many more layers of this onion to peel away. Yes. Um, but until next time, Cass, thank you so much for everything you're doing for the women's game. Uh, for the game at large. And, you know, we look forward to seeing more of you in the future. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Cass. Here you guys. In partnership with the PWHPA. Follow Noxie and Cax on Twitter at 27 Noxie and at Care LMR. The views expressed are those of the individuals and are not necessarily those of the PWHPA. Check out sdpn.ca for more Noxie and Cax and the rest of the SDPN crew. Free stars!